Female Athlete Conference. It is my pleasure to be presenting today with my colleagues on the postpartum return to sport, a holistic approach to safe integration of movement postpartum. I'm Rebecca, and then you're gonna hear from Amanda and Nathan later in the presentation. So just briefly to go over objectives, um, the goal of this is discuss, uh, oops, excuse me, address and correct any energy availability concerns, putting the postpartum mother at risk for REDS, um, discuss how to in, implement appropriate exercise strategies to foster improved bone resilience for transitioning back to fitness endeavors, review key regions for bone loss and how to implement effective resistance exercise to improve site-specific bone architecture, Consider a variety of exercises to support and promote proper pelvic floor healing for the postpartum body. Examine exercises for increased risk of pelvic floor dysfunction and how to modify to decrease risk. So I wanna start with kind of setting the stage. And as I put on this slide, um, I just wanna say a disclaimer as in the, the world of sport, we really, and especially as a dietitian, try to come from an evidence-based lens. But a lot of times we're navigating and working with athletes in areas that there are significant gaps in um, research. Not that we're not trying to fill that, but for right now, there's not very specific guidelines. So I just want to go ahead and say up front that I realize there's a significant lack of knowledge basis is the risk and the recommendations for athletes when they're returning to sport postpartum. These mentioned risk factors and recommendations are based upon applied science. So looking at what we know in the postpartum state, what we know in REDS, um, and then where that intersection may occur. I love the recent work by Ponser, who um, is known as an expert in metabolism. And he says that pregnancy is the ultimate metabolic challenge lasting greater than nine months with that time energy use peaking at 2.2 times the resting metabolic rate. So it is the longest endurance race a woman will go through. And we have to consider what their body has gone through in that past nine months and how they were able to navigate their nutritional needs. Many mothers are starting postpartum period in an energy deficit combined with hormonal dysfunction and stress state, and by stress state, I actually mean hormonally, not only the stress of being a, a new mother, puts them at higher risk for injuries and mood dysregulation. Similar to red symptomology, we know that there is an energy prioritization not only for their basic physiological needs, but actually puts that baby ahead of that mom. So many of these symptoms though have been dismissed as being normal for a new mom, being tired, having digestive difficulties, um, you know, pains and tweaks that they might have, have been sometimes dismissed as related to um, what their body has gone through pregnancy. I really love this quote from Dr. Nandita Gupta, I hope I said that correctly, that um, everything changes when you're having a baby. This includes your body. In fact, the changes to your body are so big that medical experts see pregnancy as a stress test. So when I work with athletes that are returning to activity, I really view this as they've just gone through a significant competition. And so how are we helping them recover? How are we making sure they have recovered? And how are we um, helping them get back into their activity? And so these couple slides are gonna be reminders of what that body has gone through and what they may be going through. And another unique challenge that comes with the postpartum mom is there's a lot of variation in how that body adapts after pregnancy, anywhere from immediately some hormones turn to baseline where certain areas can be up to 18 months. So really having that individualized session or individualized assessment is key to figure out how their body is adapting. But just for a refresher, remember that blood volume during pregnancy increases 30 to 50% pumping more blood with each minute increase in their heart rate. It can take several weeks after delivery for blood volume, resting heart rate and blood pressure to return to baseline. So it's important that they are not over exerting themselves as they return to activity they're giving themselves lots of compassionate care and rest so that that heart as well can return back to, to baseline. 
then I take Dr. Key's um, infograph here and I relate it to some of the hormonal changes that we see during pregnancy, not only with the REDS risk, if they're coming in an energy deficit state or they're struggling with getting um, energy availability during that time, but also the hormones that are gonna overlap as they are in that postpartum period. Like I said prior, sometimes these hormonal imbalances can last up to six months and take up to 12 to 18 months to normalize. We know that progesterone and estrogen are gonna be suppressed until resumption of first menses postpartum. And also speak to it another side, slide, sometimes that can be um, eight to nine months, especially when breastfeeding that they will not have a cycle return. Postpartum thyroiditis ranges between one to 16, almost 17% of postpartum moms. Basal cortisol levels decline immediately after birth. However, for some women may remain elevated up to eight weeks postpartum. So that goes back to that inflammatory stress state. For those that have had hormonal imbalances, it's very important that they follow their treatment guide, guidelines that were set before, such as polycystic ovary syndrome, and make sure that they're getting back to their providers that help them manage that. Nutritionally, <clears throat> it's very important that they have labs checked, but I always want to set that reminder of the prevalence of anemia in the postpartum state. We know that at one week mark, 14% of even those that have been iron supplemented have um, been defined as anemic and 24% in the non-supplemented um, postpartum group have been anemic. So looking at those same keys and risk as you see on this infograph and make sure that we are treating correctly, assessing correctly, and providing with um, proper guidance. While I didn't include this on the slide, we also have to think about the culture impressions and changes for postpartum women, especially those changes in body image weight. And so if they've also endured or trying to actively lose weight, we see that drop in body composition, which also affects the basal, basal metabolic rate, leptin levels, thyroid, et cetera. So I like to view this as the recovery period, nutritional rehabilitation, because we know that pregnancy not only incurs an energy expenditure, it also generates an inflammatory response. There's a lot of cellular healing that's going on right now, and we don't want to interfere with that. And that's where Amanda and Nathan are going to speak to, um, either in regards to the pelvic floor or bone health. Studies have shown that there's four to six percent bone loss during the first six months of, if, of lactation because of the hypoestrogenic state and calcium loss in breast milk. Again, that goes back to the prioritization for the baby over mom, and we will actually see calcium leach from the bones so that it's adequate through the breast milk. Menses on average take eight weeks after uncomplicated delivery. So if they have had complications, and that is one of the things I now ask um, when they come in, tell me what your pregnancy was like, tell me what delivery was like, and tell me that immediate first two weeks, because usually hormonally, there's going to be a delay as well, and so we want to take a look at that. It is very common for women that are breastfeeding to not have their menses resume while breastfeeding, and I do want to throw this out here there that I am by no means advocating or um, dismissing women that are not breastfeeding. I'm speaking purely to the hormonal responses that may occur if they are breastfeeding. It's imperative to treat these months as ongoing healing state, just as they would in physical therapy or rehab, using those same recovery principles as you would in the post-competition period. While we're on this subject, I do want to talk about protecting bone health. We know that there is a significant stress fracture risk between six, to six weeks to six months. And part of the reasons for that is either a sudden increase in training postpartum, insufficient strength training during pregnancy and early postpartum, a history of relative energy deficiency in sport, eating disorder, diagnosis, inadequate intake of calcium and vitamin D during pregnancy and the breastfeeding period. The other part, as I quote from this article, when elite athletes were asked about education provided, how they were able to return to sport, 
many elite athletes were discouraged or not given any advice nutritionally on how they could train and breastfeed. And so a lot of them avoided that. So we really need to hone in on supporting the athlete that would like to breastfeed and also be able to return to activity with sufficient energy. So how do we get him back in the game? First and foremost, we have to ensure that energy needs are met. And if they're in a low energy availability state, that is corrected before they begin back to activity. Um, that body is so volatile in the postpartum state, it's not worth risking letting them go out and during activities that could put them at risk for stress fractures. Really focus on eating often and energy dense. We have to take light that the mom is probably sleep deprived most days, very disconnected from her body due to the stress state. And so it's helpful if the dietitian can have more scripted eating, then we step back into an intuitive eating approach that looks more at hunger and fullness um, and really guide them during their peak windows in a day that they're more likely to be able to get more intake. So we sometimes wanna match according to what mom and baby's day looks like. Obtain blood work at three months postpartum and again six months later, looking at things like ferritin, vitamin D, estradiol, and then situationally if we need to look at B12 and folate. There likely needs to be an adjustment to training or reduction in training load according to recovery markers. So if they're having less than six hours sleep, if they have hit a stretch of insufficient intake and hydration, or if they're struggling with pain. With proper nutritional guidance, there's nothing to support that they can't breastfeed and get back to activity. So while I'll transition to Amanda as she speaks about pelvic floor, I think it's really important to follow these athletes just as we would treating the athlete with, with breads. As you can see, the postpartum state alone puts them in a very similar situation, and this helps ensure that they are not nutritionally deeply before they have resumed back to activity and minimizes their risk for stress fracture development or any other complications. Hi, I'm Amanda Fisher. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist out in Kansas City, Missouri, and I am in a clinic called Empower Your Pelvis. Today, I'm going to be speaking on the pelvic floor muscle side of this presentation. So the pelvic floor muscles are three different groups of muscles that make up the pelvic floor at the base of the pelvis. They run from the pubic bone, the front of the pubic bone, all the way back to the tailbone sacral area. In this group of muscles, we have three different layers of muscle tissue. We also have a couple of hip rotators. So any kind of hip rotation would also benefit the pelvic floor muscles. So of our three different layers, our first layer is our superficial pelvic floor. And we have a muscle there called the superficial transverse perineum. And that muscle is the muscle that tends to be cut when we have episiotomies with pregnancy during, or I'm sorry, with childbirth. So that is just something to take in or keep in mind as we move through um, these slides, because that muscle, we tend to think like pregnancy, we tend to think postpartum, pelvic floor must be weak, and that's typically not the case. Yes, you can have weakness, but sometimes we can also be dealing with tightness, just like you can be dealing with tightness in any other muscle tissue, especially after some kind of injury or surgery to the tissue. So of the pelvic floor, the muscles have five main functions. One is that the muscles need to be supportive. These muscles need to be strong enough to be able to withstand the pressure and be able to hold up our organs, our bowel, our bladder, and our uterus. These muscles, especially these front muscles we just touched base on, they are more of your sexual functional layer or of muscle tissue. They also have sphincteric control, meaning that they need to hold in, be able to close off anything from leaking out like urine, feces, or gas. Um, they also aid in acting like a sump pump. So um, your top part, your diaphragm, really connects with that pelvic floor when you breathe in. So as you breathe air into your body through your lungs, you're inhaling your intra-abdominal pressure that your abdominal cavity has to expand and your pelvic floor has to lengthen or expand. As you blow air out, that pelvic floor will bounce back up. The abdominal muscles will come back in. So it moves up and down to help with blood flow and circulation. 
The diaphragm and the pelvic floor also work together, um, pro providing this contraction relaxation of the tissue. And when that pelvic floor muscle is lengthened, the transverse abdominis is also lengthened. As you exhale and you contract that pelvic floor, the pelvic floor contracts back up. It also connects with that transverse abdominis. So they are a very close knit um, co-contraction between the two, a close knit little family. That transverse abdominis wraps around and connects with your multifidi. So you've got your diaphragm, your pelvic floor, your um, transverse abdominis in the front and your multifidi, that makes up your core or your little canister. And we want that canister, that pressure system to be working really well to aid in stability of functioning of this muscle tissue, especially pregnancy and definitely during um, postpartum period. So when these muscles are not working properly, we can deal with dysfunction. So dysfunction for us, things that we're recognizing with our patients, um, especially in the, the pelvic floor clinic, what we see our patients for tend to be like leaking of urine, feces, or gas, or smearing of feces in their underwear. We might be dealing with pelvic organ prolapse. So maybe the muscle tissue is not strong enough, or the ligaments have la are more lax, where their organs are kind of coming into that vaginal cavity. Um, so this could be like a cystocele, a bladder prolapse, a rectocele, rectal prolapse, or a uterine prolapse. You can also have any combination of the three pelvic pain. So this might be pain with intercourse, pain with inserting a tampon, pain with a speculum exam or a well woman exam, um, pelvic pain with sitting or activity, abdominal pain or discomfort. Um, the patient might be having tailbone pain or discomfort, low back pain, hip pain, again, hip rotators attached into the pelvic floor. The pelvic floor attaches into that lower sacral tailbone, low back region. So any kind of tension and tightness can pull in that area, creating this dysfunction. Um, these are questions too we will ask on any of our intake forms to see if the patients are experiencing any of this. And I highly encourage anybody who's dealing with anybody in the female population or athlete, athletic population to be asking questions as well. Are you leaking um, when you're coughing, sneezing, laughing? If we're not asking it, they're not going to tell us. Um, ask them if they do feel pressure pressure being what they might feel with pelvic organ prolapse. It'll feel like a used tampon feeling. So are they feeling pressure in their vagina with jumping, coughing, walking, running, um, any kind of pelvic pain? Are they having um, any low increased low back pain or hip pain as well? You've got to ask it if you want them to um, be more likely to tell you about it. So we like to look at pregnancy. Um, I like to look at our athletes. We want to see them when they're pregnant because we can go over all the changes that they're experiencing and help them through that discomfort. So we know the pelvic floor definitely is taking on the added weight and increased pressure from the growing weight of the uterus and the, the baby or babies. And there, we're seeing a lot of postural changes too, as that center of gravity is changing or as their breasts are changing, because that's an added like four pounds of extra weight up here. And our patients may not be noticing how much they're actually shifting their body or why they're having low back pain. And if we can help, you know, them through that transition, um, what we're noticing in the clinic is we're seeing our patients get back to sport so much sooner because we've already been planting the seeds of how the body's supposed to function and work well, that they can start doing it postpartum. And then again, moving it further along of getting them back into the clinic. So it's going over really well. Um, some of our patients, especially athletes tend to be doing too much too soon or too much too long. They don't know what to look for. So us being able to tell them the risk and what to watch out for is very helpful. Um, especially comparing that risk versus reward of where they want to be, um, as an athlete down the road when they're in their forties, fifties, and sixties. So this was a study that just came out in February from the motherhood and pelvic health, um, study. And what it was looking at was nulliparous women, so women who haven't had children yet um, in their third trimester and followed them all the way through their first year of postpartum. It was looking at their physical activity, strength, and abdominal pressure on their pelvic floor recovery. What they found was that they had a decreased or loss of pelvic floor support if they were delivering over the age of 30. If they had an overactive abdominal muscles, um, this could be over 12 minutes of endurance with those abdominal muscles. And this could also be if they were participating in higher, moderate to vigorous activity for um, more than 60 minutes a day, and especially before 
six months postpartum compared to any sedentary movement was how they were comparing that in the study. And then they showed a decreased risk of pelvic floor support, decreased risk of the loss if they were to participate more in light to moderate activity compared to sedentary activity during those first six months postpartum. And I thought that was very interesting. Um, however, the study was only done on vaginal births, not cesarean, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, the study did note that the pelvic floor support, so the support being like, are we more likely to um, develop pelvic organ prolapse, um, did not say that the activities of daily living. So things around the house, emptying the dishwasher, laundry, taking care of their child, lifting a car seat did not have any kind of, um, increased risk on the public loss of public floor support. So that was nice. So we can continue to tell our moms that they can do those things and not have any harm. However, I believe in the study, they did not go over teaching the patient, teaching the clients, how are the participants, how to actually control their system with activity. Um, and that is something that we strongly encourage in the um, public floor population. So my big thing is I want physical therapy is just like other public floor PTs should be standard care and postpartum. Um, in the first couple of weeks, it's or in typically postpartum, whether they had a vaginal or a cesarean birth, our patients are coming in thinking Kegels is the only answer. And that should not be thought of. Um, remember these muscles contract and relax. They are not always weak post childbirth. Sometimes they tear with um, vaginal births. They can have a grade one, grade two, three, four tearing. They can have an episiotomy or we could have a cesarean. It doesn't seem to matter um, if that pelvic floor is tense or tight. Remember, you have so many different muscles down here, lots of room for compensation and error. So there's lots of room for PTs to really step in and help retrain that tissue properly. If you have any scar tissue, that's could be tissue that's a little bit more tight and not moving or functioning as well. So we're really looking at ways um, early postpartum, how we can help during the inflammatory phase, but then also getting these tissues to anticipate that movement with the pressure system again. Um, so retraining the breath and pelvic floor. We also wanna think about how to activate and coordinate the muscle tissue with movement. And that is huge postpartum. Again, doesn't matter how they delivered their baby. This is something that we're really finding that needs help in these women postpartum. So we can help decrease pelvic floor dysfunction. So our main thing in the first couple of weeks is really honing in on the breathing. Um, I really want to make sure that their breath is moving their ribs out as they inhale and coming back down as they exhale, really thinking about that breath coming down to the pelvic floor and out. I do not like a big a belly abdominal um, where they're really pushing the breath out. We're really talking about just letting it come down and back up. So there's lots of training on this. Their diaphragm has been pushed up during pregnancy. And there's a lot of disconnect with the body here. There's not a lot of awareness with um, our patient population and their pelvic floor and their breath and their pelvic floor. So it's a lot of retraining that. And this could be done in our supine position on all fours, learning to relax everything and then learning to connect it together at the same time. So really thinking exhale, then pick up that blueberry or contract that pelvic floor um, and then breathe in, let it all relax. So we're doing this retraining tissue in different positions to really promote the healing blood flow circulation. We're getting them on a walking program. Um, if we're doing any, had any C-section births, we're really helping that decrease, um, the nervous system by maybe doing some scar work, um, early on, especially, but nothing on the incision until they've been cleared from their doctor. And then in our clinic, we're really going over our ADLs of movement of squatting, hinging, pushing, pulling, and carrying, because that, those are activities that they're doing with their baby all day. Um, and we're continuing to progress those through our weeks postpartum. Um, in the beginning, during our first three to six weeks, it might just be body weighted, a squat, body weighted hinge, body weighted pushing and pulling um, and carrying and really learning how to connect to their core during those movements. As we move on further and they've been released from their doctor, we um, are going to increase our walking program, but we may also increase the weight with those activities. So um, they may be doing just baby weight right now, like in those first couple of weeks. And as we move into seven and nine, we're thinking about like baby and car seat um, and watching their body at how much weight they can actually do the exercise in before they lose the connection of ribs stacked over top of pelvis and that postural piece during squatting, hinging, carrying weight, pushing and pulling. 
because um, again, they are doing all those activities at home and we wanna make sure that they're doing them properly with um, exhaling on exertion with those. With any of our walking program, I want to make sure our patients are not having any pelvic pressure, bleeding, or leakage. If they are, we are not going to progress that on to more minutes. Um, we will work on taking breaks if we need to. Weeks 10 through 12, it's again progressing it on. I want our patients walking at least 40 to 45 minutes a day, four to five times a week without pressure, bleeding, or leakage before they advance onto our running program. There's been a study done um, by Tom Goom in... I put the study at the bottom, but at he, their study looked at recommending it at 12 weeks postpartum. Again, all of this, we modify depending on how they delivered their baby um, and how things are going. When my patients start out with a running program, I tend to have them run for a certain length and then they stop because again, that pelvic floor moves with them and you're putting added weight and increased pressure during those pelvic floor muscles while running. And then they're going to stop so that pelvic floor actually gets to rest. So we can build up the endurance without turning them into a dysfunction of peeing their pants, having increased bleeding or any pelvic pressure. So we, for example, might run for a minute, rest for 15 to 30 seconds, run for a minute, rest for 15 to 30 seconds. And they might do that for 10 minutes. If that does well, then we advance the length and time. If it doesn't do well, we might advance the rest time, but I want resting instead of walking to fully relax that pelvic floor. Um, there's also a series of tests that they will need to complete before they can move on to the running as well. Um, a couple of them being single leg pistol squats, lateral step downs, and then um, step ups with slowly lowering back down. And again, at the same time during this pro um, these guidelines, I'm having them advance their functional movements with increased weight if they can withstand it. Now, all of this, keep in mind that those are great guidelines. However, in real life, what I'm finding is our patients that are returning back to work at six weeks to 12 weeks, their public floor, especially for our teachers and our RNs, our nurses, um, they're on their feet for 10 to 12 hours a day. So these um, guidelines, I want you to consider like all of these factors here play into if we're going to modify up on their guidelines or mod down. And a lot of times we're some of our patients, if they're going back into work for 10 to 12 hour days, but then they're feeling pelvic pressure in their vaginal tissue after they're on their feet all day, we're not going to progress their program. We're going to try to scale it back, mod down, figure out how we can uh, maybe activate certain portions of their pelvic floor a little bit more, and then give them things to work on while they're at their job, maybe while they're pumping, um, while they have downtime, maybe why they are feeding their baby, what can they be doing to help activate that pelvic floor to retrain that tissue to fire better for them? Because a lot of these factors here, we got to keep in mind that we got to help these all play into how they're healing postpartum. And it's not always um, as great as we think it's going to be. There's always things that play into it. And life is a huge one because now they're taking care of an infant, or maybe it's infant and toddlers at home, they have a family, they're feeling the stress of that and of all the new life changes. So that does play a huge role into it. And then if they're dealing even with a colicky baby at home, they're going to be adding a lot of increased pressure with bouncing them too. So there's a lot of different things that we have to play with, or even channeling their program into um, their home activities for them too. Okay. So I'm going to let Nathan take over the bones for the presentation and yeah. Hi, I'm Nathan Carlson, owner of Running Mate Physical Therapy, and I want to talk about how we can optimize our exercise postpartum to make sure our bones are strong and ready to deal with the demands that are placed on them and all the activities we want to participate in. There's three different topics I want to cover today. I want to talk about dosing exercise for optimal bone health. There's actually some specifics we can do to make sure the exercises we're choosing to use uh, give us the biggest bone benefit. Uh, how important a progressive loading strategy is to uh, returning to sport and how we need to remember that we're going to have to modify a lot of these ideal situations uh, for someone's specific life demands. A couple quick facts about bones. Our bones are always changing. So your bones, your skeletal system will be different than this morning uh, than when you go to put your head on your pillow tonight. It's always adapting to the things that we ask it to deal with from the foods that we eat, how stressed we are, the activities we participate in. Um, it's always fine tuning and adjusting to those specific demands. 
And it responds both to increases in loading, so increases in activity, as well as to unloading or when we do less of something or we have a big change in the, the stresses that are placed on our body throughout our day. Bone health is multifactorial. That's why it's so important to have a good team in place anytime we're, we're working with someone and we're going to assess their bone health um, because it's not just about exercise. You know, having someone like Becca and Amanda uh, in your corner during this recovery process is really, really important because they have specific skill sets that, that are going to help make it uh, a really well-rounded uh, return to the stuff that you want to do. Um, and bone health is affected by multiple systems and, and it's not just going to be one, one thing. So dosing exercise, what can we do to make sure we're getting the biggest bone benefit? Um, decreased activity in general has a negative effect on our bone health. And, and we see this when we look at people that have been put on prolonged bed rest. Uh, we see this when we make modifications to someone's weight bearing status after surgery. Um, and, and we see this when we put someone in space, when we, we ask our body to deal with a different set of circumstances than it's used to, uh, our, our skeleton adapts accordingly. And so that's why a thorough history is really, really important. Anytime we work with someone, this isn't just going to be asking them questions about, you know, the, the delivery process or postpartum, um, but really back to when they were growing up, what medications they might have been on, uh, how active they were as an individual, what, what kind of sports they participated in, what their relationship is like with food. We want to have a good picture of that person's situation before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and after to make sure that we're, we're designing the best specific plan for them and making sure that if there are areas that might need an outside referral, if I'm the physical therapist in the situation, um, that, that I'm able to get them with the right person that's going to help them with, with maybe some specific area. When we go to actually dose exercises, um, there, there's a very specific way that we can that we can make this more beneficial to our bones. Um, first, we want to make sure that we load the bones that we want to get stronger. So if the goal is to get back to throwing overhead, uh, maybe playing volleyball or playing softball or something like that, if we want those bones to get stronger, we have to load them. Uh, if we're going to go back to running, we want to make sure that we're loading the bones that have to work a lot when we run because we see that bone adapts in a site specific manner. So it's only going to adapt to the areas that are going to have to deal with that increase in strain. Um, and we see that if we break up activity into short bouts that we get a better response from our bone. This was studied by Roebling and colleagues back in 2002. It's been studied a few times since then. Um, if we have someone participate in short bouts of exercise, uh, they tend to get a better response from their bones than if we have them do something really, really prolonged. So if we have an individual that their goal is to get back to some kind of an endurance event, like running a marathon, doing a triathlon, something that they're going to be exercising for a long period of time, we don't want to necessarily push that volume knob too quick. Um, we want to make sure that we're breaking things into, into shorter bouts of exercise because we see that our bones adapt to in a more favorable manner to that. We also know that more is not necessarily better. Um, so more of an exercise doesn't necessarily give us more of a, uh, a positive response in our bones and our bones getting stronger. Um, so we, again, we don't need to push the volume uh, button too quickly um, out of the gate. We also wanna make sure that throughout this whole process that it's all working towards whatever specifically that individual wants to get back to. The, the things that we do early on, they have to be you know, a, a reflection of what that individual wants to get back to at the end of the day. So uh, a, a, an easy question that I think we can all ask when we're, when we're working with someone is what, what does that activity require, but what shapes do they have to make? What shapes does the body have to make to get back into that activity? Um, what are the specific areas that are going to have to deal with an increase in stress? So again, if I have someone going back to volleyball, um, there's probably going to be a little extra stress on their hitting shoulder than on their non-hitting shoulder. Um, if you have someone that's going back to, to doing squats uh, and wants to get back into heavy weightlifting, um, again, that's going to be a different set of demands than somebody else. And when, after we've analyzed that, again, we want to make sure that we look back and we say, how can we regress these demands um, to the early stages of the recovery process um, and make sure that, that they're all reflecting each other? So let's hone in specifically on running as, a, as an example. And again, you can do this with any activity that someone is getting back to. 
So specifically with running, our bones are gonna have to deal with strain. Our muscles are gonna have to tolerate high contraction intensities. Tendons are gonna need to store and release energy. And if you have someone that's going back to any kind of field or court activity, they're going to have to be running. And so these requirements are, are going to be there for those sports as well, if you're playing softball or basketball, soccer, whatever it might be. Specifically with running, there's areas that have to work harder than if we're just walking around during our day. Um, the three areas that we see have the biggest increase are our gastroxoleus complex, our quadriceps, and our lateral hip. Um, this was studied by Dorn and colleagues in 2012. Um, so our, our gastroc complex is going to have to be able to, to attenuate some shock on the ground and spring us forward. Our quadriceps are going to have to control our knee as it flexes under load. Our lateral hip is going to have to keep us upright so we don't topple side to side as we progress one foot over the other. When we're looking at running, we want to make sure that we assess these specific areas during that recovery process to see if there might be some discrepancies there. And if there are, the assessment is the same thing that that person can, can work on, which makes it pretty easy. So this, this, again, just kind of highlights how we're going to go about testing these things. So the three specific muscle groups we talked about, uh, we're going to assess them with three separate tests. And then uh, we have some parameters for what we would like them uh, to be able to do. So when we look at the gastroxoleus complex or the calf, uh, we want to take them through a single leg calf raise assessment. Now, ideally, we're going to be able to perform 25 to 30 repetitions of those calf raises on each side. Um, and I wanted to get into some specifics with this specific variation. So if you look at my, uh, if you look at me here, um, I have one foot propped up on a med ball. Now that can be a, a stool, that can be a step, that can be a small bench, whatever it might be. That's gonna make sure that this doesn't turn into just a balance exercise, but instead it's gonna focus solely on the calf. And then specifically with that right leg in this example, I wanna make sure that my knee is straight the whole time. If my knee starts to bend, then the test is gonna be over. That's one compensation you'll see to kind of get around someone's calf. And then we're gonna make sure that every time my heel comes up off the ground, that it gets to the same height every time. If that's as high as I can get up off the ground, if I get to rep 10 or 11 and I can't get the same height, then the test is over. Um, and again, if someone can't get to that 25 to 30 repetition goal, um, then they can start to work on this with whatever range they, they can perform and then just continue to add repetitions as it gets easier. As we hone in on the lateral step down, which uh, Amanda mentioned in her portion of the talk, this is going to look at our quadriceps. It's going to give us an idea how well we can tolerate uh, knee flexion in a single leg position uh, in weight bearing. Um, we want to make sure that, that we're staying as upright as possible. So this isn't something where we're just moving from our hips. The individual's ankle architecture. So if you look at my right ankle, that limits how vertical I can be because I have a little bit stiffer ankles. Um, but we want to make sure that we're staying as upright as we can, and it's going to give us a lens into how will we control ourselves on one foot. Um, and again, it reflects the, the positions of running quite well uh, and something that if we have a hard time with, then we can just start to work on this with however many repetitions we, uh, we feel comfortable with at the time. And then when we get into a side plank, um, the goal is to be able to hold this for about 60 seconds on each side. This is going to give us an idea about lateral hip strength. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to, again, keep that same height throughout the whole process. Uh, we try to stay nice and stacked off, uh, stacked on top of each other so we're not rotated forward or rotated backwards. Um, and again, that we should be able to complete this on both sides. Another key component that we can integrate for bone health is plyometrics. Um, so th this has been studied quite a bit in both youth populations and older individuals. Plyometrics is one of the best things we can do for our bones. We do want to make sure that, as I mentioned before, we do them in small doses with large recovery periods. And certainly if this is somebody that hasn't done something like this before, we want to make sure that there's, a, there's an easy progression into them. Um, but we see this in, in young individuals that if, they, if they're involved in a plyometric program, we can get pretty, pretty significant uh, improvements in lumbar and hip bone mineral density. Um, we see that in, in uh, athletes like gymnasts, that they, those improvements that they get in bone mineral density can, can last for their whole life, even though gymnasts have a, a similar, um, similar rate of disordered eating um, and menstrual irregularity to runners. Um, and again, to highlight the volume, the volume idea, 
there's no difference in rat bone development when they've had rats do plyometric bouts of five versus 10, 20, and 40 jumps per day. So we don't need to do a ton of these, but just a little bit of impact throughout the day. Um, it should give us a good benefit from our bone standpoint. So how do we put this all into action? Um, we want to make sure that we're getting someone back to some high loads, high loading activities. And there's a progression from where they, where they start to what they want to get back to. But those higher loads, things that are more strenuous in nature, um, they're going to be more beneficial to our skeleton. We do want to make sure that we have some long rest breaks between our activities. So I, ideally, that's going to be between three to eight hours if, we're, if the goal is to get back to exercising multiple times a day or if they have a, a, a really intense job. If we have a little bit of a break, um, that should give us a little bit better chance for our bones to recover and be ready for that adaptation again. Um, specifically, if you're working with triathletes, this is really important if they're going back to brick workouts um, or, again, multiple sessions during the same day, we would like to have those separated out a little bit because it's probably going to give us a better benefit from our bones. We want to make sure that there's a progression this whole time. Um, our bones, just like a lot of the tissues of our body, they get bored with the same thing over and over again. So we always have to be increasing how demanding these things are um, to, to remind our bones that they need to get stronger. Um, and then we want to have a little bit of variability in what we're doing. We don't want to do the same thing every time. So when we look at running, um, have, if I'm having someone that's going back to their running progression, um, maybe you're going to have them do one one run where they're just running on a sidewalk, another run when they're on the treadmill, a, a run when they're on maybe a, a, an easy trail or something. Um, just some subtle differences in variability that should allow our bones to adapt in a more comprehensive manner um, because it's not the same exact loading pattern every time. We don't need to have people do things drastically different. If the goal is to get back to running, we want to make sure that we're having them run. Um, but, but if we can give them just subtle differences in what they're doing, that should help them have a little bit more comprehensive skeleton, which is which is certainly important. Uh, and again, to highlight what Amanda had talked about at the very start, uh, we want to make sure that we're including some of these fundamental movements, pushing, pulling, squatting, hinging, carrying, and we're making sure that all of this reflects their specific situation. Um, in an ideal situation, again, we have all these things that would be helpful, but every person's a little different. Um, people will have, you know, different access to childcare, different work demands. Um, it, everything is going to be a little different, but uh, depending on who you're, who you're working with, and we want to make sure that we take some of these principles and we apply them to the individual situation without overwhelming them with things to do, without overwhelming them with a ton of specifics, but more just some general ideas um, and, and make sure that we're incorporating those throughout the recovery process and back to their return to sport.